some of what you say may be true. Um, but I'm very grateful to you. I want to start by thanking uh, Rama and uh, Sravan for organizing this meeting in the first place, thinking about it. And uh, then Rajesh Gok Kumar for inviting me to give these Chandrasekhar lectures. Um, I am also grateful to the whole uh, Bangalore and Indian scientific community with which I have felt always uh, very close, no matter how many thousands of miles I have been. Um, Bangalore especially is a special place for me. So I am thankful to a whole lot of people for a whole lot of reasons. Um, since uh, Spenta embarrassed me a lot, I will embarrass him a little bit now. Um, the, uh, as he said uh, rightly, I knew about ICTS for some time, and uh, even before it was uh, created. And a lot of people rightly can take pride in the institution that is running so well, the present director, its staff, its faculty members, all of that. But uh, there is uh, one person um, who brought some taste to the whole place. Uh, Spenta knew from the beginning that unless it is done right from day one, it's very hard to get it right. So Spenta has great taste, and I think he brought some of that to building this institution. And I'm very happy that Rajesh is continuing this tradition, and I only can imagine better days for the uh, center. Thank you. Okay, I now want to uh, talk about uh, the talk as advertised, uh, Chandrasekhar's fluid dynamics. Uh, Chandrasekhar, of course, worked in many areas, as I will uh, tell you a little bit about. But not uh, much gets written about or talked about uh, on his fluid dynamics work for reasons that I will also mention. And this is how he looked uh, around the time he was working in uh, fluid dynamics. Um, as you um, may remember, and I have written here, his date of birth was 1910-1910 in the British style of writing or the Indian style of writing, which is uh, very easy to remember. And uh, his... Um, uh, Chandra's uh, work, or Chandrasekhar's work in fluid dynamics spanned 48 to 60, which is right smack in the middle of his lifetime. So at the time he got into this, he already had established himself, and he was in full powers of his uh, creativity, and he spent a dozen years on the subject, and this requires or this deserves uh, some thought on our part. So this is the purpose of my talk. Uh, but let's talk about something for which he is uh, much better known uh, to start with, and then I'll go back to fluid dynamics. On August 1, 1930, the SS Pilsner, which is what this uh, ship is, a member of the Lloyd Triestina fleet, so I sort of know that from another point of view, carried the 19-year-old Chandrasekhar from Bombay to Venice, en route to Cambridge, who reached England on August 19th. So he may have gone through Trieste, I, I'm almost certain he did. Um, and he had time between August 1st and August 19th, more or less, give a, a little bit, where he could have partied all the time on the ship, but instead he uh, thought about uh, white dwarfs and things of that sort, and prepared a paper. And this paper um, is what led to his Nobel Prize. And um, the Nobel Prize came much later. It's 1983. This is how Chandrasekhar was when he actually did the work. And uh, this is how he was when he received the prize. This is the longest time gap that has ever been between the work and the prize in the history of the Nobel Prize. And of course, this catches the attention of a lot of people. And uh, therefore, uh, by the way, this is the uh, nomination uh, form 
which I stole from somewhere. Um, the, nomination the nomination concerns the discovery of the direct connection between principles of relativistic quantum mechanical degeneracy and the masses of white dwarf stars, about which I will say a little bit. From that brilliant beginning, Chandrasekhar went on to fundamental work in dynamic stars, radiative transfer, hydromagnetic theory, stability and evolution of rotating self-gravitating fluid bodies, and the development of post-Newtonian approximation to general relativity. Chandrasekhar has been a central figure in the development of all the major branches of modern astrophysics through his fundamental contribution to the physics of radiation, particles, and gravitational fields. Of course, you read this, there is very little of fluid dynamics in it. There is, of course, uh, this uh, hydromagnetic theory, but that's actually a part of, only a small part of what he did in fluid dynamics as a whole. This uh, sort of justifies in some way uh, the time I have spent on trying to understand what it is he did in this area. Because Chandrasekhar um, is, of course, very well connected to a large, was very well connected to a large community, and furthermore, because of this 50-year gap between the work and the Nobel Prize, he captured the imagination of a lot of people. And a lot of people have written books about him. The best one among them is um, Chandra by Kameshwar Wali. And uh, I will talk about Chandra as, uh, instead of Chandra Sekhar from now on. And uh, all these uh, many books, you should particularly read Chandra Sekhar and his limit by uh, Vengatraman here, uh, who is known to the Indian community quite a bit. It's written with, uh, with a style that is conducive for learning even as a youngster with a very little physics background. So I, I recommend that very heartily. And uh, so, um, what did he do to his psyche? That is, his work somehow got recognized in that sense. Um, did he care about it? Did, he, did it really matter to him? Uh, the best way is to listen to what he has to say himself on this uh, very short uh, segment of the video. Uh, can I have the uh, loudspeaker on, please? The first uh, part, a little bit of it is probably inaudible, but it will become very clear uh, in a bit. I was an undergraduate. I knew very little physics, but the physics which I used was something which I could have read, and I was curious what would happen if that was applied to stars. And I found this limit. But I don't see that it tells anything about my, my future work. I mean, I could have stopped at that point, and, and the discovery would be there. But if I am what I am in the sense that I have lived in science for 60 years and pursued science, that to me is far more important. The important thing is, no matter what other people say, you value certain things you do because of your personal reactions, not because somebody else says it is good. No matter, uh, even if it involves getting a prize of a hundred thousand dollars. So I thought that is a great theme, the great theme, especially for youngsters to remember um, what he said. Um, what matters is what one thinks uh, oneself and not what others think. Um, and I, I thought this is a message that might be worth emphasizing for uh, youngsters here especially. So Chandrasekhar had 65 years of outstanding career, outstanding in every sense of the word. And during that time, he had the habit of working in an area for a certain number of years and uh, mastering it to the extent that uh, was possible at that given time, and then um, write up a monograph about it, and move on to a new area as if it is as if he is a graduate student. 
Um, so he himself described um, that his work can be divided into these following chapters, one on stellar structure, which is the one that won him the Nobel Prize, stellar dynamics, including Brownian motion, theory of radiative transfer, hydrodynamic and hydromagnetic stability and turbulence, uh, the equilibrium and stability of ellipsoidal figures, relativity and relativistic astrophysics, mathematical theory of black holes. This statement he made in 1983. He lived on for another dozen years or so, and he worked on the theory of colliding gravitational waves and non-radial perturbations of relativistic stars. And finally, as a labor of love, almost, he worked on this book, Newton's Prinky Appear for the Common Reader, and it was published just a few weeks before his death. So that's uh, the whole uh, um, um, summary of the areas in which he worked. And attached to him, attached to Chandra's name, are these things, Chandra's second limit, which is what I'll say a few words about. This is the one that won him the Nobel Prize. Chandra's X-ray observatory, about which most of us know. And Chandrasekhar friction, Chandrasekhar candle function, which astrophysicists are very fond of. Chandrasekhar number, about which I'll say a little bit. And real equations and variational principles, etc. So he did well in various ways. And as I was telling you earlier, his habit was to write up a book at the end of each of these segments of his career, and pretty much all of them really represent his work um, for posterity. In fact, uh, if you want to write about Chandrasekhar, it is not the dearth of material that um, makes it hard. It is just the enormity of material that exists in on Chandrasekhar, written by himself and his friends and his admirers, and you have to really make sense out of a whole lot of those things. Not only was Chandrasekhar's scholarship uh, continuing without any interruption, but the community also, in fact, recognized him in many different ways. For example, when he was about 57, he got the National Medal of Science in the U.S., and many others that I will not um, take you through. So let's begin at the very beginning of uh, uh, Chandrasekhar's life and uh, career. Um, his uh, hometown, so to speak, the town where his ancestors were from, is there at the bottom, Tanjavur. And then at the time Chandrasekhar was born, his father, who was in government service, Northwestern Railway Service, was in Lahore. Lahore is now a part of Pakistan, but that's where he was. And uh, here is a picture of Chandrasekhar uh, at the time he was still in Lahore. And uh, from Lahore, they moved to Allahabad, which is uh, around, uh, around uh, there somewhere on the river. And uh, then, there was, he was not uh, going to any school at the time, he was homeschooled, so to speak, until they settled into uh, Madras. Uh, by the way, this Lahore has this special thing that um, around 100 miles, within 100 miles of Lahore, there were three, three Nobel laureates. The one was Abdus Salam, who also was born very close. And then uh, he got the Physics Nobel Prize. And the other was Hargobind Kurana. He was also born uh, within 100 miles of Lahore. It was just an extraordinary coincidence that within 100 miles, and not uh, temporarily too separated either, three Nobel laureates were uh, born. Anyhow, um, the family moved to Madras um, there, or Chennai today. And then he went to high school there. And thereafter, he went to the presidency college, also in Chennai. And uh, when he was a student in presidency college, he met uh, Sommerfeld. Oh, by the way, and before I go further, if you're talking about concentration of Nobel laureates on the 
eastern part of India is a little town called Calcutta. <laughs> and there are four Nobel laureates, Tagore for literature, Raman for physics, uh, Teresa for um, peace, and uh, Amartya Sen for uh, economics. Um, and of course, the rest of the country is a little hard to find too many Nobel arts. Um, Chandrasekhar met uh, Sommerfeld, so, and he described the encounter with Sommerfeld as the single most important event in my life. And why was that? Uh, Chandra was, uh, as a student, as a diligent student, he had mastered Sommerfeld's atomic structure and spectral lines, but was told by Sommerfeld at this meeting that his book was outdated because of the birth of quantum mechanics. And uh, apparently, as a, a kind of uh, consolation, he left the galley proofs of his own article in, in which he applied Fermi Dirac statistics for the, for the electron theory of metals. And that's how Chandrasekhar really became aware of quantum mechanics and Fermi Dirac statistics, which he applied for a certain problem on which he published uh, before he left uh, college. And as he was trying to see um, who should uh, communicate that paper to the Proceedings of Royal Society, which that was not his first paper, but uh, that's the paper I'm talking about, um, he found that uh, Fowler, this is the other person who has had considerable impact on, on him, had actually used Fermi Dirac statistics, and I will explain how. And so he thought, well, Fowler would be the person uh, who would appreciate that. And in fact, Fowler communicated that paper to the Royal Society and two other papers, also to a philosophical magazine. Uh, this was all before Chandrasekhar graduated from his BSc honors. And uh, what was it that Fowler had done, and what is it that in the two-week period on the ship that Chandrasekhar did, which is what I have to say a little bit about before I get to fluid dynamics part. As you all know, uh, the size of the stars is determined by the balance between the gravitational pull and uh, the um, thermonuclear uh, energy that's created the core of the star, which uh, gives you a radial pressure outward. And in the course of time, if you wait long enough, the nuclear reactions will come to a pass, they will die, and so the star begins to collapse by gravitation. And of course, uh, you might think it, this will go on until the star somehow um, um, converges to a point, if you are uh, mathematically say, uh, speaking about it. But actually what happens is, um, not necessarily always, at the time, at the time, um, say 10, 20 years before Chandrasekhar uh, graduated, people knew there were these white dwarfs, which had a certain size, size of the uh, type of the Earth, for instance, but had the density of a million times more than that of the Sun. So you have to imagine that the density of the gas there is really uh, very strong. And it was not collapsing any further. What it means that the, gravi the enormous gravitational force had to be countered by something else. And there was no classical way one could explain that. The only way one could explain, which is where Fowler came into the scene, was to use quantum mechanics. Basically, the idea is that if you, if you uh, put the matter under enormous pressure, then the electrons are stripped of the atoms and you have basically a sea of electrons. And if you apply Pauli's exclusion principle, it just shows there will be some, other, uh, some additional force um, of this gas that will be able to counteract the gravitational force and then you have the, you have the stability of these stars. So that's all I wrote down in more careful words than I've just used. Now that was what um, uh, Chandrasekhar knew uh, even before he left the country. And he had in fact written a paper, a manuscript, um, which he had it in his possession, trying to improve upon Fowler's work. And 
uh, during the journey, what he thought was, well, of course, Fowler had really taken these uh, electrons to uh, move about in a Newtonian type speeds, but what if they are relativistic? In fact, one should expect them to be relativistic. And then he redid all the calculations. And lo and behold, what he found was, instead of a small correction, as he had anticipated would be the case, there exists a limiting value of about 1.5 solar masses, uh, above which the protection that Fowler had concocted uh, by his uh, theory did not exist. So massive stars are free to contract or suffer other fates, supernovae and neutron stars, black holes and things of that sort. And therefore, our galaxies are no longer calm and quiet, as in fact people had conceived them to be. Every star will somehow, um, you know, wither away into a neutron star and the whole uh, uh, galaxies will be peace and quiet. But actually it is not. I mean, it's violent and grand and things of that sort. And that's the uh, conceptual change that Chandrasekhar's work brought about in the, in the astrophysical and astronomical world. And that's the worldview that had to change, and that's part of the reason why it took so long for the Nobel Prize to be awarded. But part of it was uh, somewhat political. You will probably have heard of the, of the controversy between Eddington and, and Chandrasekhar, and I do not want to take your time to tell you about it. It's written enormously, uh, extensively in Wally's book, for instance. So when he went, when Chandra went to see um, Fowler, this uh, he had to wait until October, uh, he had two manuscripts with him, one that he had already, already written that is slightly improving upon Fowler's work, and the other which is the revolutionary work that I just uh, mentioned. Fowler was very happy to accept the former and immediately communicated to the Royal Society, but when it came to this revolutionary thing, he demurred. He said, well, I don't know, let me talk to Milne. And so uh, apparently he dis Chandra just found out that it takes a long time for the them to make up their mind. And he wrote up this two-page paper and sent it to Astrophysical Journal, which is a US journal, and had it published. I'm sure it didn't make uh, either Milne or, or, uh, or Fowler very happy about it. Um, he did it one more time, actually. Uh, something like that. Um, he improved up upon this work. Uh, it's a two-page paper, which uh, you can read uh, relatively easily. And he wrote another paper, and uh, he knew that Milne would not approve that. So he waited until Milne went to Potsdam, and he sent this paper to uh, Zeitschrift for Astrophysics. As luck would have it, uh, Milne was visiting Potsdam at the time, so the editor asked him to referee it, and uh, he, of course, wrote a negative report. Nevertheless, the paper got published, but it didn't endear him to um, uh, the people with whom he was working. So in any case, that is the sort of background for Chandrasekhar. And uh, somehow he entered fluid dynamics. And why did he do that? He had no pedigree in fluid dynamics. He had, uh, his professor didn't know that much, for instance. So, um, I want to say a little bit about that. Chandra started work in radiation. This is after his stellar work. And at that time, he was completely confident and comfortable because he had just gone out of the influence of his, uh, of his uh, mentors. Uh, I have here Milne, I have uh, also Eddington. So, he was uh, becoming a person on his own, not intimidated by the big stars, um, uh, pun intended. Um, and his two books on stellar structure and dynamics were becoming standard references, and he'd just been elected FRS in 1944 at the age of 34, relatively uh, young for FRS. Um, he felt that his standing was secure. so. Um, then he began to ask, well, what can I do that is difficult? Um, in his own words, 
what can I work on uh, that will find solutions only a decade or two later? He was really not interested in instant gratification, and he had all the patience and the ability to withstand the work that it entailed, and settled on turbulence. It was clear to him that many interesting problems in astrophysics could not be solved unless turbulence was understood better. We cannot expect to incorporate the concept of turbulence in any essential manner without a basic physical theory of the phenomenon of turbulence itself. So that's how he got into uh, this business. And uh, so how he started it, he had these so-called Monday evening seminars in which he was fond of giving talks himself. And he began to work, discuss the works of G.I. Taylor, von Karman, and Howard. This is the uh, famous work um, that sets uh, the relation between second and third order uh, correlations in isotropic turbulence. Cole McGrath, which is, who is here, Judge Batchelor, who will appear later in my discussion, and Heisenberg. And I will tell you how Heisenberg figures into this as well. And uh, during the dozen or so years he spent on fluid dynamics, until 1960 uh, 60 or 61, he enjoyed his association with many young stars, some of whom you recognize. Uh, Bill Reed, who was very well known in hydrodynamic uh, stability. Norman Lebowitz, um, Russ Donnelly, who passed away some time ago. Dave Fools, uh, Peter Vandervoort, Eugene Parker, a great uh, magnetohydrodynamic person, and uh, Nakagawa, and, uh, and others. So, um, what did he do exactly in uh, these few years? Um, I won't be able to describe all of that, but I will tell you a little bit. He got into the game by working on Heisenberg's theory and I will say what that is briefly. And then he worked on axisymmetric turbulence. This is the um, subject on which uh, I wrote the first paper, and I was working for Professor Narsimha, but he, he actually said I should publish it on my own, which is what I did. Um, at that time, I read that paper with great care. Density fluctuations in compressible turbulence, MHD turbulence, convective turbulence, gravitational instability, etc. And I will say a little bit about Heisenberg's theory and axisymmetric turbulence, what he did, and uh, not worry about that. And uh, Heisenberg's theory was, uh, came about in the following way. Heisenberg, when he was a PhD candidate, wrote his thesis, many of you probably don't know, on the stability of flow between parallel plates. His advisor, Summerfield, gave him the topic, saying that uh, I wouldn't give it to any other student. I only needed uh, the very best to handle that problem. Uh, in any case, Heisenberg got a very poor grade for that uh, uh, thesis, not because the thesis wasn't good, but his experimental um, work in uh, Wien's lab was really not up to the mark, and Wien was one of the uh, ex uh, thesis at, uh, evaluators, and he gave the worst possible grade, and Sommerfeld gave the best possible grade, and so the average was really not that great. In any case, um, he gave up uh, hydrodynamics and had moved on, but around, uh, after the Second World War, some of the German scientists were rounded up, so was Heisenberg and von Weizsäcker, and they were uh, put away in the safe house for MI6 in this place called Farm Hall. So they were there for a six month period of time and uh, they were record their conversations were recorded and all of that stuff. And during that time they were not allowed to work on atomic physics as it was known at the time. And so uh, Heisenberg and uh, one Weizsäcker, they both worked on the turbulence and they wrote papers next to each other um, in uh, um, ZAMP, and then also in the Proceedings of Royal Society. And um, so uh, that was one part of what uh, he did. And then after a gap of about uh, three years, this is 1951 and this is 1954, he re-entered turbulence and he worked on a dynamical theory. 
And the dynamical theory had uh, three papers, um, which I have listed here. And this particular paper, which was the extension of this first one, which appeared in Rokhraisok, um, was rejected in the Proceedings of Royal Society. He just went ahead and published in a, a physical review. And he had enough. He had had enough of that, and he gave up uh, turbulence at that point. And I would like to say what it entailed, where, why he gave up, what the issues were. And uh, maybe also tell you why there was this gap of three years. Chandrasekhar was um, a very uh, fast worker and very concentrated attention. So uh, every two months he would write a very long paper, for instance. So having a three-year gap is really very significant for, it's a long time scale for him. So Heisenberg's theory, what is it? If you uh, think of the energy spectrum, this is the distribution of energy across wave numbers, which is a continuous function. Um, uh, high magnitudes for low wave numbers and, and small magnitudes at uh, high wave numbers. At any given wave number, you might say, well, the energy is being cascaded from the smaller scales or a lower wave, from the large scales or lower wave numbers to smaller scales or higher wave number. And if you are into local dynamics, that is to say everything relating to how much the energy is being um, cascaded or communicated depends upon the uh, properties of the spectrum around there, around that wave number. You can define something like an eddy viscosity, which is the integral of the spectrum um, in normalized to give you, give you the right dimensions um, from that wave number k all the way to infinity. That is, small scales now act on the big scales as if it is some viscous action and just taking away energy uh, out of them. Now then, you can define the energy dissipation rate, which is the viscosity effect, plus also this effect due to this eddy viscosity. So this is the pure kinematic viscosity, and this is the eddy viscosity part. So that's the equation. It's very easy to write it down if you subscribe to the principles that uh, Heisenberg subscribed to. And this here is also um, an integral, integral of this quantity from zero to infinity. So this is really an integral differential equation. And uh, Heisenberg didn't solve this equation. He based, sort of looked at the asymptotics of it on both ends. And he showed that on the low wave number, it is consistent with Kolmogorov's five-thirds. On the high wave number, you got a k to the power minus seven. And uh, so he wrote up that paper. And Chandrasekhar's entry into this, he well, he looked at the paper and said, well, this equation can be solved exactly, which is what he did. And uh, then he wrote this letter to, to uh, Heisenberg. Um, and he exactly said, well, I read your papers with great interest, and you can actually solve this, and that's a solution. And then he went on to talk about the numerical constants. Heisenberg, of course, said uh, he was very pleased, but he was embarrassed. He didn't really notice the solution himself, etc. And he also said, well, George Batchelor in Cambridge is really also working on similar things, and that was... Um, Chandrasekhar's introduction to George Batchelor. Um, so, I will tell you a little bit about that interaction and what it had to do with the three-year gap, etc. Let's go to the next one on axisymmetric turbulence. Um, what uh, the main idea is simply uh, this: you have an axisymmetric turbulence, that is turbulence with one preferred axis of symmetry. And you want to write down axisymmetric tensors. It may be correlation functions or spectra or anything like that. And they have to obey certain symmetries. And therefore, you start out with the most general, uh, general uh, tensor possible. And it has to make it divergence-free, first of all. And then you have to make sure that it obeys all the symmetry. And uh, Batchelor had actually worked on this problem before. Um, but he, he really didn't know how to do this, uh, this thing right. That is, he, uh, his ma he didn't go far enough in the, in the mathematical structure of axisymmetric tensors. And that's what um, Chandrasekhar did. He wrote two papers, very beautifully uh, written, but you have to work your way through it, which is what I did as a graduate student. 
And so he will uh, tell you in his paper, in this paper, the theory of axisymmetric tensors will be developed to the same degree of completeness that Robertson developed for isotropic turbulence. It turns out the essential part is how to represent a certain tensor, an aspect of the theory which Bachelor did not consider. Uh, with the theory of axisymmetric tensors as forms completed, uh, the uh, reduction of the equations of motion is straightforward. So he wrote down the equations of motion uh, in terms of two scalar functions. Uh, he, uh, in one paragraph, he says, well, Bachelor didn't develop the theory far enough. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, pleased uh, George, but anyhow. Um, so that's the uh, page where you represent the axisymmetric tensor in terms eventually of two scalar functions, Q1 and Q2, and these are the equations. Uh, this is no, uh, no uh, assumptions of any sort uh, uh, that you have. This is just a kinematic theory, or what Bachelor calls uh, analytic theory. So um, he moved on and he then developed the uh, equations that are um, like the Karman Howarth equation, which is really what these are. And uh, then he worked out the decay part and all of that, and that was, it really puts the whole, the whole subject to rest somewhat. So, what's the story of this three year gap that existed between 51 and 54? Until 51, he had correspondence with all these people, you know, the ones whose photographs are short, in particular, George Batchelor. And there were many, many letters going back and forth. And the letters in time became very uh, abrasive, somewhat abrasive. Not very, is, very is not the right adjective. Somewhat um, complaining about some little details and things of that sort. And in 51, um, Chandrasekhar had thought he had really understood um, the essence of the analytic theories of uh, turbulence. And he wanted to write a book and he, wrote to Bachelor asking, well, what do you think? I want to write this book. And Bachelor, who was himself writing a book, he said, no, there is no really need for two books. Uh, mine is halfway through. And uh, basically saying to Chandrasekhar that you shouldn't write the book. And uh, Chandra didn't write the book. And to, even though he was very gracious in how he responded to it, it was clear he was a little put off by, by this. And to some degree, I think it was this kind of interaction with a number of people that led him to say, well, okay, uh, I'm not really going to work on turbulence for a while. And uh, part of it is that uh, Chandra's style was not to depend too much on intuition. He was a very equation-bound person. And in turbulence, sometimes there's all this uh, phenomenology, there's big eddies, and uh, small eddies, and they rotate like this, they have helicity like this, all of this. So that really didn't appeal to him, all these kind of qualitative arguments. And you can see in Bachelor um, Chandrasekhar correspondence, uh, there is this um, two cultures somehow really not coexisting uh, very well. So um, around 54, uh, Chandrasekhar went to Princeton and gave a talk in uh, the physics department. Von Neumann was uh, in the audience. And he gave this talk on turbulence, all the time complaining about, uh, you know, there are no standards in turbulence, and um, there are uh, making jokes about, uh, about the lack of uh, theory and a lot of superstition and things like that. And uh, uh, some people in the audience didn't like it at all. So uh, one of them took Chandrasekhar aside and said, why don't you do something about it if that's how you feel? And that's how he got back into turbulence. He said, well, actually, let me do something about it. And uh, what did he do? In turbulence, normally what one does, as Rahul described in the first day itself, um, you take... Uh, correlation between two fluctuations, equal time correlations. You take velocity here, velocity there, and take a correlation function between them, but they are measured at the same time. So he said, if you do that, f of r is just one of those functions, e of k is a spectrum, 
that would be complete only if there were no phase relationships between different Fourier components. Of course, this is very obvious because the spectrum doesn't give you anything about space phase relationships. And he knew that if the structures and things of that sort had to be talked about, you have to bring in the phase. And so he thought, well, the only way to do that is, uh, well, incorporate some elements which describe these phase relationships. It would appear that by introducing the correlations in the velocity components at two different points and at two different times. So you have f, uh, which is not only a function of the um, x1 and x2, but also there would be t1 and t2 um, in these functions. And uh, then we can incorporate features which are the result of these phase relationships. So he was really excited about this. He, he was excited. Um, he wrote to all the people with whom he had correspondence. He wrote to G.I. Taylor. He said, oh, I'm really, this is exciting, all of that kind of stuff, which knowing uh, from the description of all the people who met him uh, and uh, uh, slight personal experience myself, to get Chandrasekhar excited, is not that easy, but he obviously he wrote this. Uh, well, this is not the paper he wrote. So, uh, this is the second paper. So he wrote this paper in phys in Proceedings of Royal Society, which was accepted. And what was the general idea? The general idea was um, Kolmogorov's theory. Um, it's sort of very ad hoc, and you have a large scale, you have a small scale, and if you want to talk about what the boundary conditions are for the theory, uh, you have to go all the way up to L, where it's uh, the large scale, where it is not applicable, and so you don't know what kind of boundary conditions to use. And so he, mathematically for him, it was a very difficult thing. He was not happy with saying, well, K, L, very much less than unity. I mean, uh, these asymptotic theories he was not very fond of. So he basically said, you know, what is wrong is really the kind of quantity one looks at. You should really be looking at this kind of quantity. You have now um, velocity difference squared, but this is at one time and one point in space. This is second point in space, second point in time. And this function, and you should be taking at this derivative of this function, for which boundary conditions are pretty easy to uh, write down. And uh, usual arguments like Kolmogorov's will give you this functional form for this function chi, and in the so-called inertial range where viscosity is, a, is essentially put to zero, it will have a very simple function uh, like depicted here. And he wrote down an equation for chi, and he solved the equation uh, with modulo some factors and things like that. And so he thought he really had it licked, so to speak. Um, but, um, but it turned out uh, the first paper, well, got accepted. The second paper, this is this one here, got into real problem. It was turned down by the Proceedings Royal Society. And in his correspondence, um, I tried very hard to see who the referees were. But I have a good idea, but I'm not sure I should say it. But he felt, Chandrasekhar felt that the English, um, within quotation marks, uh, English, uh, well, he didn't use the word mafia, but I use it because I don't remember the word, um, put him down somehow. So um, the result was uh, he wrote this paper up in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, physics, uh, physical review. And while he was writing this, he was bombarded by correspondence from a lot of people, among them Bob Craignan. Bob Craignan was an upcoming uh, theorist in the turbulence literature. And he said, this is all wrong. This is wrong because um, the theory violates conservation of energy. And in fact, it's a subtle form of violation of a conservation of energy. And Bob showed that at great length. And this correspondence uh, went on uh, for some time. In the meantime, uh, this is how Chandra felt about it. Uh, he complained about the referee reports to Heisenberg, who had actually said good things about it already. Meanwhile, the Royal Society has rejected the paper on the basis of referee's report. Mm, I don't even understand. It says referee's report. So maybe two referees wrote the same report. I, I don't know. 
um, which among other things calls uh, the paper fallacious and of no value. I've tried to be as critical as I can, but I can't see that there is anything unsound in what I've said in sections two and three of the paper. These are the sections with which referees have objected. If you have had a chance to examine these sections, I should be most grateful, etc. The referees have used the root language, but they, may, they have stated no arguments with any substance. If you've gone astray, I would like to know where. Uh, I have no idea whether Heisenberg actually responded or not. I, I have looked for it in the archives and haven't uh, found it. So, uh, what was Kraikman's uh, uh, argument? I already told you a little bit about this, uh, this uh, energy, uh, energy conservation. And uh, this is the so-called realizability. The origin of inconsistency is discussed. The arguments developed are used to demonstrate inconsistencies in Chandrasekhar's recent theory of turbulence, which is what the previous paper is about, um, et cetera. Okay, so, um, in fact, uh, Chandrasekhar was a referee for this paper. He said, well, I don't want to come between you and the author, but I tell you, it's a crank, crank paper. You publish it, you'll ruin the reputation of the journal but the journal published it anyhow. So, um, so uh, by the time he got through all this, uh, I think he was quite frustrated, really. Um, he says somewhere that was the worst part of his life, those two years he worked on this. And uh, he uh, gave up uh, the subject, never again to return to turbulence. Now, Actually, this abrupt departure had uh, several consequences in my view. And one of them is that, uh, the ca you know, uh, somebody says that uh, Chandra's work, uh, some part is wrong. People will say, okay, everything he did must be wrong. So uh, people sort of stay away from it. You know, you write one wrong paper, which all of us at some point or the other will. And then, People will say, yeah, that's wrong. And so people who don't know you will stay away from you, which is pretty bad. Um, and he himself did not produce any students in the field, stick around to defend the work or clarify the subtleties. This is something very important for uh, youngsters who become professors uh, soon or will be uh, established people. Uh, you have to stick around and you have to defend yourself. Otherwise, it's very hard to know. Uh, you will be at the mercy of the people who interpret you all the time. And he was aware of it himself, this fact that he is having left the field prematurely, uh, created, uh, uh, you know, uh, less interest in his work than it should have been. He expressed it to a number of people, among them to Mohinder O'Brien, who is no longer alive, but uh, Professor Narsim and a few of us probably knew him. Um, and uh, what was the result? Some of the results he had derived in his papers were re-derived by others. For example, Anik Puke re-derived some of the MSD results. And in fact, the consequences, many people don't even know that Chandra actually derived those results first. So in fact, there is some virtue to sticking around a little bit. So now let me go on to stability. Um, and... Uh, and uh, that's the book um, that he considered all these uh, very many topics. And I will not take you through all of this. I give you a summary of uh, what I think about the book and why it is important and what its uh, limitations are. And when it was written, it was reviewed very favorably. For example, Gillies wrote in Physics Today, it's now at least half a century since it became clear to applied mathematicians that you to henceforth be prudent before ever publishing any of their research to check whether it had not already been done by Rayleigh. The time has come to amend the rule to read Rayleigh or Chandrasekhar. I mean, so uh, um, I will describe that in a minute, whether it's true or not. Howard, uh, Lou Howard, some of uh, whom here know him as well, very distinguished fluid dynamicist, said systematical theoretical treatment uh, one which will be wanted in the library by all on the desk of many, which I think is true, although I don't know how many actually have read it. Um, those whose work is connected with the hydrodynamic or hydromagnetic stability. So it was received pretty well. 
And uh, in Chandra's book, which is very big, 684 pages, something like that, um, there are many results. Some of them are known results which have been systematically um, put together in the same language, etc. And some of them are new. The thing that's new in particular, for example, relate to thermal convection uh, effect of rotation. For example, if you rotate, uh, the onset of instability is inhibited. That is, you have to go to higher Rayleigh number for the instability to take place. That's his theory. Those are the experiments. And uh, similarly, um, I won't explain all this. Similarly, um, uh, well, okay, this is the critical wave number. And uh, then also the same effect of uh, magnetic field. Magnetic field also inhibits instability. And again, there are these results. This is the Chandrasekhar number. And uh, you see the, uh, critical, the critical Rayleigh number as a function of the uh, Chandrasekhar number. It follows this. And uh, asymptotic result is that the critical Rayleigh number is proportional to the uh, Chandrasekhar number as well. So that's the critical wave number. So he had these uh, results which um, nobody had until until then. And uh, one, I, my opinion is, having read the book uh, recently, uh, not from cover to cover, but trying to understand a significant part of it, two virtues of the book as I see. Uh, with a few exceptions, which I will mention briefly, Everything of interest in linear stability of classical hydrodynamic and hydrodynamic stability can be found. Many problems are discussed in the same style, using the same techniques. So for a reader, it might also look like a boring catalog of things. Um, gaining entry to any problem is easy if you master a technique in one field and just go out. There's some quaint terminology and all that after so many years. Nevertheless, I think it's a worthwhile book to understand. It still acts as an inspiration for the application of modern computing, which is what one needs in order to go beyond what Chandrasekhar had done in the book in the context of hydromagnetic uh, problems of astrophysical uh, context. But uh, Chandra came from an astrophysical background, and so he ignored some areas of stability. Uh, at least one of which was by design. This is the paradigm of stability of viscous shear flow, the one uh, Rama, you and I were just talking about a few minutes before the talk, because Lin's book had just um, appeared and it had done a splendid job of covering the area. Also, he was not an atmospheric physicist, obviously, so he didn't write about internal gravity waves, baroclinic instability, which is really very important for the atmosphere, and Rossby waves and things of that sort. So in other words, it sort of, um, by design or by accident, uh, ruled out certain communities from taking a lot of interest in this subject. Astrophysics, of course, um, certainly very much interested, but the other areas, not as much. So if you talk to a traditional, uh, um, I, I don't mean it in any derogatory way at all, traditional fluid dynamicist uh, who really doesn't uh, go too much into astrophysical problems. Uh, Chandrasekhar is not the book to read. C. C. Lin would be the one to read. And of course, later on, there have been fantastic books by Drazen and Reed and people like that. So uh, I want to say something here. If you read the book, or uh, at least read it uh, at some cursory level, you will think that the person who wrote the book was really uh, writing it with uh, great calm and had enormous time on his hands, very patiently checking everything and things of that sort. But actually, uh, Chandra's working style was very different. Uh, the book may appear as a masterly account of many stability problems in classical fluid dynamics, written in leisure and quiet, but actually not. Uh, shows the, he shows enormous pressure under which he operated or chose to operate. And, for example, he had committed to uh, submit the book uh, to the publisher spring of 1960, and he wanted to hold to it, unlike a number of us who promised to write books but actually deliver very slowly or never. 
Um, and he was racing against time to meet it. And here are some uh, selected quotes. Three weeks were left now. Starting with 13, the book has, um, um, I think, 14 chapters. And at extreme pressure, I realized that uh, one of the theorems had to be formulated in tensor form, and the, uh, so he started that. He developed a whole new approach. And I had to organize all the figures, and all this was finished. I was so tired, I decided to go to New York for an invited talk. Um, on returning from New York, the weekend and Monday were spent on various sections of the book. And it was finally Tuesday morning that I started chapter 14. I actually thought I would abandon the idea. I knew it would disappoint Donna, that is his secretary. So he decided to work on it anyway. The theory was worked out late Wednesday evening and wrote up the first draft before going to bed. Early on Thursday morning, started my second draft, etc. It was finally completed by 9.30 p.m. I called Donna at that time, and she came over to start typing the last chapter. That was the kind of relationship that the secretaries and professors used to have at that time. Um, most of the Friday morning was occupied by filling the formula. Saturday to the airport, and the following day, the manuscript was handed over. So that's the kind of intensity with which he worked uh, pretty much all the time. So, uh, he also worked on other things. Uh, I'll say a few words. Um, during the war time, um, everybody was working on uh, war issues, and he uh, was not a U.S. citizen, and therefore there were some security issues about him going to Los Alamos, which uh, Juan Nyman encouraged him to do. Um, and until 1953, many of you don't know, the United States was not giving citizenship to Asians in, in general, and so he was not going to uh, become a U.S. citizen. But he had a British passport, and so he, uh, Juan Nyman somehow helped him uh, get to the Ballistic Research Lab in uh, Maryland. And uh, he spent uh, two and a half years there, but um, three weeks in Aberdeen and three weeks in uh, Yerkes, uh, which was where he was at the time, he would go to Eric's three, teach for three weeks, go back to Aberdeen, spend three weeks, and go back and forth like that for two and a half years. And he was very scared about going to South because of the racial prejudice in the, in the U.S. at the time. And in fact, uh, Maryland was as far as he was willing to go. Uh, even in Maryland, he himself felt uh, uh, many instances of racial prejudice. And he wrote this uh, paper, which is not published, but it is a, a report of the lab on the decay of plane shock waves. And he wrote another report on the normal reflection of blast waves. And they are referred to in, um, in, um, um, in current and, uh, uh, um, and uh, maybe Hilbert or uh, one of those books. So at least it uh, came to the attention of the right people. And then he was also working on uh, stability of Taylor Kuwait flow uh, with helium-2. He didn't know much about the physics of helium, and he didn't care about it, actually. He just uh, knew there was this two-fluid model, and he could uh, solve it and do the mathematics on, and had Russ Donnelly do the experiments, and uh, they, they worked very well, and uh, so he was quite pleased with it. So that's uh, about his, uh, his work. Uh, in uh, some nutshell, but I want to end my uh, talk with a few personal comments. Uh, he was really accomplished, uh, devoted scientist, huge capacity for disciplined work, and it comes through in every letter he writes, every, every uh, paper he writes. Wrote extremely well, and uh, many Indians write very well, by the way, so um, he was a great teacher, although extremely demanding. Uh, sure of his science, uh, not particularly arrogant when he wrote it. Uh, more of the last word type, you know, he was not really the one who would uh, go and invoke intuition and jump into uh, some uh, type of thinking. Held himself to very high standards, hard taskmaster, expert high standards also of others, often disappointed because of that. Um, had strong likes and dislikes. So he would go to somebody's, uh, uh, somebody for a visit, 
and then he would just come back and never go again to visit the person or meet him or her, uh, him mostly. Um, didn't handle criticism well. Um, not only the Eddington controversy, but even this turbulence episodes that I mentioned, um, he really didn't know how to handle it. And he felt lonely and unhappy despite many attainments. And I would like to talk a little bit about this last part. And from Wally says, Chandrasekhar says, the hope for contentment and a peaceful outlook on life as a result of pursuing a goal has remained unfulfilled. I don't really have a sense of fulfillment. I find it very difficult to reconcile with, namely to pursue certain goals all your life only to become doubtful of those goals at the end. So um, that was um, a kind of revealing statement. And my unhappiness or discontent is because of the distortion in some sense of my life, of its one-sidedness, of the consequent loneliness and my inability to escape from it all. In a way, it sort of uh, is sad. Um, and uh, I want to maybe tell you a little dubious um, anecdote which I heard from a very respectable source. And uh, uh, Chandra um, was very fond of Roger Penrose, uh, who is known to some of the audience here. And uh, uh, he would fly to uh, Oxford to see just Roger for two days. On his own expense, he would go talk to him and come back. And one day, apparently, he asked, Roger, do you use artistic considerations in your scientific work? By the way, I remind you how Roger looks like. And Roger, of course, diplomatically says, do you, Chandra? He doesn't want to answer the question. And um, Chandra says, what do you think? <laughs> and uh, he says, I think your work is like Claude Monet's. And Claude Monet, you know, was the master of Impressionist paintings and uh, lived up to 86, painted nearly to the end, and in the Impressionism style, which he more or less created, prodigiously painted many canvases, small and large, and you take the same theme and, dry, and uh, paint it in uh, different lightings and this and that sort. I here have uh, for you um, some paintings of uh, Monet. You see, you can, for example, the same thing appears several times, or, or these, for instance. So I sort of took them just to make the point. So, and uh, the main point is that, apparently for some, after, some time after this conversation, Chandra used to repeat that Monet was underappreciated um, most of his life. When others pointed out, that's not really true, you know, Monet was really appreciated a lot. Chandra would say, no, 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 it's, it's true, he was underappreciated. So acclaim was slow in coming to Monet, but um, he was actually appreciated a lot. So, this is the last uh, slide, uh, and uh, if you look at Chandrasekhar's writings, um, he, you could imagine that he had some context in mind, but he knew that putting the context in the paper somehow uh, diminished the value of the paper because the context may come and go. Tomorrow it may be another context, today it is one. So he sort of didn't want to talk about that so much, and I think this uh, sentence, which he was fond of quoting, uh, reflects his beliefs. On one occasion, no more than 50 years ago, Milne reminded me that posterity in time will give us all our true measure of true measure and assign to each of us our due and humble place. And in the end, it's the judgment of posterity that really matters. And Milne further added, he really succeeds who preserves according to his lights. That's what he was saying in the video. Unaffected by fortune, good or bad, and it is well to remember that there is in general no correlation between the judgment of posterity and the judgment of contemporaries. So he was really writing for posterity, and in his way, um, that's the uh, ultimate judge of what uh, one has to be. So, um, um, so let me start with credits for all the people that uh, help me.
think that we'll do. Thank you so much. Thank you, KRS, for that marvelous perspective on the fluid dynamics and life of Chandra. That was superb. I now request Professor Narsima to hand over a memento to him. <laughs> I, I want to say, I think he's been, well, I did read that other one as he noted that. I think he's done a marvelous job, a uh, lot of work, and uh, yeah, the light that shines on what uh, Chandrasekhar did, my own contacts with him were very few, but um, I remember asking uh, Chandrasekhar when he was in one of visits to Bangalore, he was still continuing to do turbulence. He said, no, I gave it up. It's too controversial for me. <laughs> and the Yogi, uh, Srinivasan's lecture has explained to you why. Well, I'm uh, very proud, as Chandra was, I mean, sorry, as Chandra was saying, <laughs> of the many things you have done. <laughs> and therefore, it's a great pleasure, a matter of great pleasure for me too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's also a matter of great uh, pleasure and pride for me that one of the persons who is organizing all this is another student of mine. <laughs> Thank you for asking me. <laughs> okay, uh, probably this is traditionally the wrong order, but we can take a few questions. Rajesh. Thanks, that was really wonderful. Uh, I, I had to sort of, uh, uh, one question uh, on uh, something you mentioned at the beginning about these ellipsoidal figures of equilibrium. And now probably that was motivated more by astrophysics, I suppose, but the, uh, the, uh, w uh, did he bring uh, his fluid dynamics uh, thing to bear no. so much in that? Uh, no. Uh, uh, I see. No, in fact, I, I would say, now, the area was sort of an antidote to his fluid dynamics days. Because in fluid dynamics, uh, you have to do simulations, you have to do uh, theory, you have to look at experiments, you have to really be detail-oriented. And he was just getting tired of so much detail. Uh, because uh, when he wrote the book, it was, you know, he redid some calculations or his secretary did them for him. And uh, uh, new graphs, uh, new way of writing. And so he actually wanted to take a, a respect from all this. He wanted to get back to something that is um, just there for beauty, just there for uh, its majestic uh, way. And that's how he moved to ellipsoidal figures and then to relativity. Relativity, of course, was very complicated also. But still, for him, it was a sort of grand problem. It was not just a lot of little problems from which you build intuition, which is what fluid dynamics requires. So I, I'm not sure he was really motivated by fluid dynamics. Uh, all the history of all the figures that worked on it before, all the great names, for him at that point, somehow associating with all these great people uh, became important. In fact, uh, the fact he went to general relativity and was happy to talk to people like Penrose and uh, Kip Thorpe and others who really um, embraced him was extraordinary. It was a very change in big change in the in the in this uh, in his own uh, mental outlook uh, that's how i think it worked for him uh, sorry, just maybe as a brief follow-up, uh, not, not a follow-up, a slightly different question about, uh, it was very interesting and brought out very well in what, uh, what you, how you put it, uh, that uh, uh, he started with a, a quantum mechanics and quantum theory, but he never really ever came back to that. Uh, was there any reason? 
Um, I think when he spent some time in Copenhagen, he was actually mixing with all the people who are leading in quantum mechanics. Um, but um, my feeling is um, that quantum mechanics was not the kind of thing uh, Chandra would have done, especially at that time. Uh, Heisenberg, I mean, I, if I, when I read this paper, he created this uh, matrix multiplication. God knows from where, where he got it from. I mean, to me, it looks like a, like a revolution from somewhere. Uh, Chandra was just not the type who would, who would do that sort of thing. For him, uh, it was all well laid out, and he would do such a superb job. And in fact, the work he did on the astrophysical thing for which he got the Nobel Prize was a little different from the, from the pattern into which he fell, I would say, somehow, after that. So he was still young, he really didn't know uh, what was right and what was wrong. And uh, he said, what the heck, if it is, if the degenerate gas is relativistic, I want to find out what it means. Uh, I don't know that he actually <laughs> uh, did uh, that sort of thing uh, later. So he was a dif different type of uh, physicist from Heisenberg and, uh, and, um, and uh, others. Uh, he was more like Lord Rayleigh. Um, and, and upon career, I mean, it's not that it is to be diminished at all, but it's a different type of, different way of doing things. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful lecture, Srini. You, you comment on his sense of loneliness uh, late in life. And in that context, I was wondering, did he have uh, any other interests besides science, uh, perhaps regarding music, art, and so on? And yeah. did he have family? Did he have wife and children? Yeah. So um, he didn't have uh, children. Uh, his wife was very devoted to him, and uh, uh, she lived uh, for uh, uh, a few years after, uh, uh, long after he passed away. And uh, she is part of creating his legacy in some sense. Um, now, um, His interest, until 1974, which is the time he got the first heart attack, he basically didn't take any time for anything. And in 74, he was prohibited from doing science by his doctors. And so at that time, he really got into, um, he, he, he was always a very literate person and, uh, and was very keen on things. But he took the time at that time to really delve into this. And he wrote this uh, book, which is a collection of essays he delivered at different places, um, Beauty and Truth, or Truth and Beauty, something like that, which is really about his perspective on, on, uh, on uh, science, uh, the beauty of science, um, and also the relation between um, scientists and artists, uh, what the, uh, how they are different and how they are similar, etc. So it's sort of interesting to read. Um, what is interesting to read, he always, of course, cites everybody from left to right in the Western world, but very rarely does he mention anything about the Indian world in particular. I mean, there is so much about art and, uh, and science that he could have said. But anyway, barring that one, uh, one comment, uh, that's a very, very beautifully written book. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it is, uh, until, um, until the last, um, he was working on this Newton's Principia. His goal was to take, pick some, uh, some of the theorems or propositions, uh, close the book, Newton's book, and try to sort of re-derive them on his own. And he sort of explains how uh, this went about. And he was very proud of that work. I heard him give a talk uh, in the American Physical Society for its 100th anniversary. And somebody in the audience actually asked, did Newton know anything about chaos? And Chandrasekhar didn't even understand what the heck it was about. I, I know that. I know he didn't understand. Um, uh, so the, what killed Chandrasekhar uh, technically was a second heart attack. But I think what really killed him was the review he, he got on the book. Basically, the, the person who wrote it, a very famous philosopher, he said, well, he may be a great physicist, 
but he is not a great historian of science. And for historians of science have a different view of how things must be developed. Um, so that's the essence of it, and I'm sure that's what killed him. I mean, I say this uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. yeah, the fact that he didn't have any children, uh, I think, contributed to uh, some of uh, his loneliness. He was well connected with nieces and nephews who really are a very um, distinguished group of people, many of them here and some of them in the U.S. But still, I think uh, uh, there was some, some distance. Uh, thanks for this uh, very fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, a question about uh, his uh, contributions to fluid mechanics is speculative and you may have answered it already. But uh, do you think, had he persisted, and uh, not seen so much blowback or uh, faced so much negativity. Do you think he would have made uh, some seminal contribution? Or what, what do you think he might have most contributed to in this field? Well, the stability, uh, clearly, um, how he systematized the whole thing uh, would have to be the crown uh, of his achievements in uh, fluid dynamics. Um, there are, uh, of course, uh, in, in, in particular, the magnetohydrodynamic part is the part where he really uh, was single-handedly responsible. Uh, even in his turbulence work, the hydrodynamic part is, um, is not as original as the hydromagnetic part. He derived, for instance, the relevant equations for MHD that just were not there. Um, whereas the others, you know, like the axis symmetric theory that I talked about, well, Batchelor, if only he had done it a little bit um, better, he would have gotten the result. But uh, so that you have to isolate certain parts of his work. And uh, MHD would be the one, uh, one MHD turbulence. And uh, of course, uh, stability, also MHD rotation in particular. Uh, for example, take Taylor Quid flow. Taylor Quid flow was very well known uh, for, Taylor did a beautiful job of it. But if you look at his paper, the six order differential equation, at that time, the machinery for doing stability was not very well known. So he has this elaborate pages and pages of algebra that really are just are impossible to understand. Uh, I mean, he, only he sort of knew. Chandra took the time to sort of write it down in the proper way, you know, in the way in which stability calculations are done. So it's not original, but on the other hand, uh, it is really an important uh, contribution. So that's how I would put, put him, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he was appointed in Chicago in the observatory. Yeah. But then he moved to physics department. That's right. This part is not quite clear about in history, I mean, yeah. one is book as well. So could you elaborate on it? And yeah, it is. How uh, was he hired in observatory? He was a theorist. Yeah. So uh, the Department of Astro Astronomy and Astrophysics, or Astronomy as maybe it was called then, of the University of Chicago was in Yerkes at the time. It was, you know, it just was near the observatory, so the department was there. So he was hired into the department at the University of Chicago. Um, by the way, uh, his appointment was made against the recommendation of the dean uh, and uh, some key faculty members um, uh, because of racist connotations. The president had to interfere and make the appointment. Um, and uh, the president was very proud of his, uh, of his um, taste in making the appointment. And Chandrasekhar had a very good personal relationship with him for many years. Um, so uh, he was there in Yerkes for many uh, uh, years. And um, at some point, there was some issue there as well, administrative uh, things. Um, and uh, he basically moved to the, uh, Fermi uh, was very gracious. Um, and so I think it worked out well. And afterwards, he just stayed in the university. See, usually these observatories are really not observatory. You know, they have a lot of hardcore theorists as members. So like even Princeton Astronomy Department was uh, Princeton University Observatory. So, you know, it's just a yeah. misconception that observatory is really just, you know, observers per se. But the idea was he really changed the astronomy department uh, in Chicago. 
uh, sometimes to the consternation of uh, uh, people who observe things. Uh, for Chandrasekhar, it was all mathematics, but it was uh, not uh, astronomy. Is not observation. I mean, mathematics. Period. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing you did not mention probably is is the Chandrasekhar Velika of instability, yeah. which is at the root of all accretion. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. Uh, kind of stuff. Yeah. And also, once I traced this idea that galaxy formation involves cooling of gas comparable to the dynamical time scale, it goes back to Hoyle and from Hoyle back to Chandrasekhar. Yeah. So these are pretty interesting stuff. Uh, I didn't <laughs> mention uh, MHD particularly, but you're right. Um, but nowhere in Chandrasekhar's book do you feel uh, that he knows what he is, why he is doing it. Um, so in fact, it had to be rediscovered by uh, these guys, uh, two guys. And it is known now, both in their names and in Chandrasekhar Velikov's name. I, I don't know if because now it's known as the magneto rotational yeah, instability. That's right. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, I think, a very good name, yeah, actually. Agreed, agreed. So the the point is, um, it's not clear at all if you read Chandrasekhar uh, that he knew. I mean, a magneto rotational instability was not created by that time. It was created much later, both the term and the field itself. So it's not clear whether he knew where it would apply, but he did it anyway. And Velikov uh, did it independently, as you know. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. I, I could uh, have said that, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I say it in my article. It's but it's just... Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you.